Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's ASC faculty lecture. Tonight's is the second talk in the spring 2010 semester. And today we have my friend, Lyle Corbett, who interestingly gave a talk on dinosaurs earlier today in the lunchtime talk series. But he assured me this one's different, so I'm not going to be bored. Um, I would never be bored when Lyle talks anyway. Um, Lyle is an adjunct professor of earth science here at Adams State College. He just finished his bachelor's degree here in geology with minors in, I'm going to remember this, biology and English. So he should be able to speak real good to us as we as he talks to um, He's also been on gigs, actual dinosaur gigs, here in Colorado, Utah, and uh, North and South Dakotas, I believe, right? Yep. So he's got a lot of interesting experiences in the, and the stories to tell, so hopefully some of those will see again find this pretty interesting. He's going to talk to us tonight about Colorado dinosaurs. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Lyle Carter. Thank you, Dr. Stalos. I'm going to turn off some lights here so we can see the screen a little better. Let's see. Oh, that'll work. All right. So the title of my talk is Colorado Dinosaurs and the Mesozoic History. I'm going to try to focus on uh, the, the past and uh, the dinosaurs that lived in the past will also see some of the traces that they left behind and as you can see on the table I have quite a plethora of the different dinosaurs that we had. Um, the first slide here of course has our state flag and it also has our state dinosaur which is Stegosaurus. Uh, this dinosaur became the state fossil by a group of fourth graders that petitioned the local Congress and they decided to name it the state dinosaur. It was found, um, the most complete one was found in Canyon City. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. So we're going to be dealing with the Mesozoic Age, which is the middle age of uh, geologic time. It goes from the Triassic, which starts at 250 million years ago, goes to about 209 million years ago. We'll go into the Jurassic, starting at 208 million years ago, and goes to 145 million years ago. And finally, the Cretaceous, which starts at 144 million years ago and ends 65 million years ago. We're also going to be looking at some of the traces they've, that these dinosaurs have left behind. Um, and there are some that didn't leave any traces. However, um, due to migratory patterns and so forth, they've been found in states from as far north as Montana and as far south as New Mexico. So it's very, very probable they would have traveled through here during migration. We're going to be looking at the world in different, uh, during these different time periods with a, and we're going to talk a little bit about the climate during these different time periods, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. We're going to look at the dinosaurs that lived in those time periods from Colorado. Where they fit in the in the ecosystem at the time, and so we're going to start with the Triassic. And here's a picture of the Triassic. Colorado would be well, it would be roughly in this area here. All the continents are connected at this time. This is 210 million years ago. You'll notice that I I did say that the Triassic started about 40 million years earlier than this, and dinosaurs actually didn't show up in the fossil record until about 230 million years ago. And as far as Colorado is concerned, we didn't have any discoveries that date back any further than 210 million years ago. Now the climate is pretty dry and desert-like. The interior of uh, the supercontinent of Pangaea would have been very dry. Very, um, very mountainous regions on the on the outside, so a lot of the rain falls on the on the coasts, and a lot of the uh, interior places get or in the rain shadow. The closest closest modern equivalent today is Kenya, but there was no grass back in the Triassic. We don't have grass until very late Cretaceous. In fact, there weren't even any flowers at this time yet. So a, a total different ecosystem. We're dealing with a lot of things like ferns, mosses, um, cycads, and and those things. The dinosaur that is discovered here in Colorado was Coelophysis. Now, Coelophysis is, there's probably been over 200 skeletons found down in Ghost Ranch in New Mexico. Here's an artist's rendition of Coelophysis. He's about 10 feet long and, and probably about this tall. 
what we have of Coelophysis are footprints. They're in several different places. Um, but that's, that's about all that we have. Now, it's a little, it's a little uh, suspicious to just go off of uh, footprints, but based on the size and the time period, and um, considering that most of the dinosaurs would have looked about like Coelophysis as far as meteors go that left these footprints behind, it's a pretty safe bet that Coelophysis ran through Colorado. He would have been a small meat eater. He wouldn't have been the top predator by any means. There were much larger predators, a lot of crocodiles and so forth, and there were also much larger herbivores. He probably would have dined primarily on uh, smaller lizards and uh, insects and uh, possibly even small pterosaurs, which were flying reptiles around at the time. Now we'll go a little bit further ahead. As you can see, not a whole lot has changed in the, in the world. Going into the early Jurassic, 200 million years ago. The climate's still pretty much the same. Very similar to the, the climate that we had in the late Triassic. There's two dinosaurs that are discover, discovered, again, both meat eaters. Um, the first one's a little more fun to pronounce, and it was actually a lot simpler to pronounce before they found out that a, a bug had the same name as this this particular dinosaur and they had to rename it. The original name for this dinosaur was Syntarsis. Very easy to say. And, and instead we get this Megapnosaurus. Now if a, that's, the, that's the scientific creed though. If there is an animal that already has that scientific name, you can't give it a, you give another animal that same name. The other one that we have is a Dilophosaurus. And if any of you are familiar with Jurassic Park, that is the spitting dinosaur that uh, gets the computer nerd And again, what we have of them is uh, footprints, a lot of footprints. The preservation in the, in the early Jurassic is, is still okay. Um, hasn't been a lot of digging. It's a lot of hard sandstone to go through. Makes for uh, excruciatingly long uh, collection time and, and everything else. And the preservation, if you're busting anything out of that, can take a very long time. And a lot of times the bones will tend to crumble. Um, we have footprints from them, the Dilophosaurus here, and again the Megapnosaurus, not a whole lot different than uh, the Coelophysis, however, we do see this small crest here on the Megapnosaurus and the much larger crest over there on Dilophosaurus, it actually had the twin crests, and if you're thinking that maybe this is a juvenile and, a, and an adult, well they are very closely related. They, they do have different skeletal structure and we have uh, cross sections that tell us that this was a full grown animal as well as the uh, Dilophosaurus there. And that picture in the top left is from uh, an area outside of Grand Junction where these footprints can be found. And now we'll move forward to Jurassic Park as most people know it. Things have changed. You look, uh, the continents are starting to come apart. And uh, we have Colorado again, right, right in this area. You probably see over in this this area right here. There's a mountain range. Those are the ancestral Rockies. The ancestral Rockies are really pretty much worn down now. They're our first set of, of Rocky Mountains, and what we have now are a lot younger. Uh, you can see Africa and uh, South America are very much separated from from North America. And there's as the plates move further, and as we get into the Cretaceous. Europe and uh, North America will actually be connected. But the, uh, let's move on into the climate. It's a semi-arid savanna with plenty of vegetation. Now, interestingly enough, the, the climate's actually pretty dry. What we do have is uh, monsoon seasons every now and again. So there's a, hot, a dry season and a, and a wet season. The other interesting thing um, is that the water table is very high at this point. So it's providing plenty of underground underground water for the, a lot of the plants to grow. And they're going to need to grow and grow very fast because of all the animals that we have during this time. The most dinosaurs from Colorado are from the Jurassic period. There's about 20 of them. So we'll, we'll go through quite a few of them here. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a list. I don't know if it's completely uh, alphabetical. It might be as far as the different types of dinosaurs are concerned. We have Allosaurus, Ceratosaurus, uh, Elaphrosaurus, Marchosaurus, 
Another fun one to say, Tenny, Calagrius, Torvosaurus, Apatosaurus, Barosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Amphicelius, Haplocanthosaurus, Supersaurus, Camptosaurus, Othnelia, Dryosaurus, Stegosaurus, Mimora, Pelta, and the smallest of this bunch is a little dinosaur called Frutidens. It's only about 28 inches long and could pretty easily fit in the palm of your hand. So we'll start with the meat eaters. On the top is Ceratosaurus. He was about 20 feet long, probably about six to eight feet tall, and weighed about a thousand pounds. The next one below him is the uh, dinosaur called Torvosaurus, uh, one of the larger meat eaters that would have been in competition with Allosaurus. On the bottom we have uh, Tanny Calagrius, which uh, in most recent uh, looks at him, he may be an ancestor of Tyrannosaurus rex. And now we get to more of the fun part. This is a Ceratosaurus jaw piece. This is the top part of the jaw. You see that they have really long teeth and uh, quite an overbite. And uh, one thing that you'll probably notice about Ceratosaurus is it's got that nice horn on, on its uh, skull and we have the horn here as well. This probably would have had a, a keratin sheath on it and may have uh, been about this far, as far as in life. Probably mostly for display and probably wouldn't have grown into the dinosaur till it was uh, in growing into adulthood and worrying about uh, reproducing to the next generation. The next dinosaurs we have here on the top is Allosaurus. This dinosaur here is Elaphrosaurus and this is Marchosaurus. Elaphrosaurus is probably the fastest dinosaur we have in the Jurassic. Between 40 and 50 miles an hour it can run. Uh, Marchosaurus is kind of a smaller version of Allosaurus. Allosaurus is probably the most common dinosaur found as far as meat eaters go in the Jurassic. There are different species of Allosaurus found throughout the Jurassic. Allosaurus could get to be about 40 feet long. Um, I have a lower jawbone here of Allosaurus, and the teeth are actually pretty small as compared to that of, of Ceratosaurus. He's only half the size, but he's got twice the teeth. I also have a couple other pieces, another piece of Allosaurus, and this is the, this is the hand of Allosaurus. Nice little uh, three-fingered claws there, um, and pretty big, powerful arms. Um, probably would have used these to hold on to, to prey as it's uh, getting it towards its mouth. Allosaurus, interestingly enough, doesn't have quite the strongest bite, so it needs something else to help it digest its food and grab hold of it. Now we're going to get to the uh, plant eaters. The uh, one on the top is Apatosaurus, which most folks are familiar with, the name of Brontosaurus. And uh, they were discovered roughly the same time. Brontosaurus was actually named two years later and uh, they had mounted a skull on it that wasn't quite the same skull as a, the actual uh, sauropod. And uh, Sauropods are, are notorious for that because their skulls relative to their body are really small. I mean your skull is about this big and the rest of you is uh, 60 feet or better. And uh, so they were digging in the quarry and they found a skull very similar to this dinosaur here. This is a Camarasaurus. And they said, well, it's close enough that we can just put the two together. Well, years later, they went back to a similar quarry and they found a more complete skeleton of Apatosaurus with the skull right up on the, on the neck vertebrae. And they said, we've got a problem here. This is the same dinosaur. Which one of them was named first? Well, it turns out that Apatosaurus was actually named two years before Brontosaurus. And so that lovely uh, thunder lizard and, and very common name has to be thrown out the window because the first person to name that species, that name sticks. And there's a lot of paleontologists who've tried to bring back the name of Brontosaurus, but you just can't. Sorry to say. Apatosaurus was about 70 feet long and uh, probably weighed in the order of 20 tons. Camarasaurus was a little smaller. He was uh, about 60 feet but uh, weighed about the same. Much heavier, much heavier build. And uh, I have an Apatosaurus vertebrae here. This is the tail vertebrae. So, um, you 
have that there. I also have some pieces of Camarasaurus here. This is the lower jaw of Camarasaurus. And you can see that they, they have teeth here. These, these would have fallen out. Interesting thing about these teeth, they have a sort of spoon shape to them. Now this is just typical for Camarasaurus and a closely related uh, animal called Brachiosaurus. Now you'll notice here, maybe a little bit, that these guys have these big big feet. Well, they also have these nice big claws on their, on their front feet. And if you are able to look at these footprints, sometimes you can actually see this claw at the front of that, of those footprints. Um, these guys were not speed demons by any means. Their, their speed probably would have been one to three miles an hour. Not very fast at all, but if you're big enough, you don't have to worry about predators. Size is a, is a good deterrent of being eaten. Um, Sauropods are probably the most common, common animals found in the Jurassic as far as bones are concerned and they're really hard to miss because they're quite large. This is Brachiosaurus. This one was found outside of Grand Junction. Uh, this dinosaur is at least 80 feet long and the neck extends to 40 feet. So it's about as tall as a four-story building. Probably would have been on the order of uh, 40 tons one of the tallest dinosaurs that we have and uh, one of the more complete ones that we have that's a good sized sauropod. Sauropods are, they break up into several pieces and they're hard to put back together. We have uh, Diplodocus here on the left which is clocks in at about 90 feet but is only probably about 15 tons. Much, much lighter built than uh, its very close relative Apatosaurus and you'll notice that the teeth of uh, Diplodocus and Apatosaurus are right up in the front. They don't have a spoon shape to them, they're more like pencils. These guys did not chew their food. They couldn't. So what they would do is they would strip the leaves off of the surrounding vegetation. And uh, we also have an interesting thing. It, uh, there's still some debate over whether these guys, Diplodocus or Apatosaurus, could really raise their necks up very high. The musculature and everything else, so these really long necks, which are about half the, half the length of the animal, are really good for sweeping across, but not so good at, at going up and down. Now, dinosaurs like Camarasaurus and Brachiosaurus are built differently and don't have that same problem. This is a dinosaur called Haplocanthosaurus, another sauropod. Mostly complete. Um, remains have been found in Canyon City. It's roughly the same size as a Patosaurus, so about 70 feet. This is one uh, called Supersaurus. This was found in western Colorado. It's, uh, it was originally thought to be part of another dinosaur which uh, was uh, named Ultrasaurus, but uh, as they got to examining the bones, it was actually two different dinosaurs, a Brachiosaur and, and this dinosaur called Supersaurus. And uh, Super is a pretty good name for it. It's 130 feet long. And uh, as you can see, feeding up on the, on the tops of trees, probably wouldn't have been a, been a little bit over 20 feet tall at the hips. Um, these guys would have, all sauropods would have been more herding animals, so these guys probably migrated in and out, otherwise all that vegetation that we have would have been gone. Um, but uh, it's a veritable meat market for any predator that's there. You have one of these guys keel over and you got food for weeks. Now here we go to the next one. The one on the bottom right is an animal called Barosaurus. Very long neck, very similar to Diplodocus, about the same length. And up on the top is an animal called Amphicelius. Now Amphicelius has a very interesting story. It was discovered by a scientist by the name of Edward Cope who found the vertebrae. And the uh, vertebrae that it found, that he found, was similar to this one. This is from a totally different dinosaur, but this is the basic shape of the vertebrae. The vertebrae itself would have been eight feet tall. This lone vertebrae that he found, he called this animal Amphicelius. He had the uh, person who was out there in the field digging it up. It was pretty crushed in very, very poor state of preservation. He had it shipped back east to Boston, and nobody's seen the bone since. He made drawings of it, and uh, scientists today have looked over the drawings and looked over his notes, and they said, well, you know, he didn't make it up. They've been searching for it the past few years. Uh, 
the director of the Paleontology Museum up in Denver, his name's Ken Carpenter, has gone out to Canyon City where this guy has been, this dinosaur was found and has looked for pieces of it. They have found a few pieces, but nothing quite as spectacular as this vertebrae. Now, Amphicelius is a monster among monsters. The uh, length for this guy would have been well over 160 feet. So if you go out onto the football field, you stand at the goal line, go out to the 50 yard line, and you have your head and tail there. Huge animal. Um, there, are, there are some debates, maybe this is a really large Diplodocus or, or so forth, there's just not enough pieces to, to say otherwise. So until then, uh, Amphicelius, huge critter, but uh, still kind of surrounded in mystery, you don't know a whole lot about it. Some of the smaller plant eaters that would have been amongst these giants, the largest of the bunch is Camptosaurus. Camptosaurus is a relative of Iguanodon, and this is Camptosaurus's hand. And then the one here on the bottom is a small dinosaur called Othnelia. And I have Othnelia's foot here. Not very big. And these guys didn't grow very big. In fact, they would have only been about this tall if they have the rest of the skeleton here. It would only be that tall. Dryosaurus is a little bit bigger, about 10 feet long, would have been a pretty good meal for most of the predators that were around. And then this small one that we see is at uh, 28 inches. This is the Frutidens that was just described this past year. This animal was very, very small, and the interesting thing about it is in the skull. The teeth, it actually has small little fangs. This is uh, typical of a, of a dinosaur that came earlier called Heterodontosaurus, which means different teeth. And these dinosaurs are thought to have been possibly herbivores and maybe, maybe omnivores because of those different kinds of teeth. But uh, we have hopefully, dis I've hopefully dispelled the rumor that all dinosaurs were big because this guy would have been extremely small. Now we get into the armored variety. The top dinosaur that we have here is called Mimora pelta. It was found in western Colorado. And just below him is Stegosaurus. You'll notice the uh, pieces of armor on the Mimora pelta. Here's a nice piece of that armor here. Would have stuck out from the flank and would have discouraged any predator from hopefully taking a bite out of it. This guy was about 10 feet long and is one of the first uh, ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs that we have from the Jurassic. Um, we don't have any other discoveries of these guys until the Cretaceous and we were wondering, well, where did they come from? Well, now we have some ancestors of of where they first showed up. Now the Stegosaurus is quite a bit bigger. He's about 30 feet long. He's at least seven feet tall here at the hip. And uh, he has his wonderful plates on his back that are still the subject of question as to what did they do. They could have been used for uh, display during courtship. They could have been used for um, possibly defense. And they also could have been used to help regulate the body temperature. I also have a example of one of the smaller plates here that Stegosaurus would have had on its back. And uh, don't forget the uh, tail spike on the back of Stegosaurus. He's got four of them. And interestingly enough, if you guys are familiar with the far side and Gary Larson, this tail spike is actually named a Thagomizer. And if you do a search for uh, Thagomizer, you'll run across a cartoon that has a picture of a caveman and he's pointing at a picture of a stegosaurus and we say we call this the Thagomizer after the late Thag Simmons. And scientifically this is the Thagomizer. This is what it's called. So Gary Larson is, is, has some credit in science. It would have been bone. Um, now, each one of these, whether it's a claw or whether it's one of these spikes, they would have also extended another six inches or so. And uh, the protein that uh, would have helped them extend to this, this length is a protein called keratin, which is in your fingernails and in your hair. This is just the bony core, and we'll get to, to more of that as well with uh, triceratops and a few others that we're going to get to as well. Now we'll move ahead to the early Cretaceous. 
125 million years ago. So we skipped about 25 million years. Um, one of the things that's interesting is you can see um, there's an interior seaway beginning to form here. Colorado's not underwater yet. It will be. Colorado's in this area here. We still have the ancestral Rockies. Europe is, a, again, a series of islands. And uh, if you want an extreme example of what possibly global warming could look like, this is it. There are no, there are no polar ice caps at this time, and a lot of this water has melted. It was a lot hotter back then. This was a period of, of global warming. The globe itself was actually quite a bit hotter than it is now during the entire reign of the dinosaurs. And a couple of the dinosaurs that we have from this area. Now, it, it is a little colder than, than the Jurassic, but not a whole lot. Uh, this is where we have our first flowering plants, and there were a lot of them. Um, millions and, you know, about 400 million years ago or so, we had our first insects, and it took, them, it took the plants that long to catch up and, and evolve the pollen mechanisms that they have now. No grass as of yet. And there's three dinosaurs discovered here in Colorado. You'll note the one that's in quotes. It's because it hasn't been officially described and we only have one bone of it. Um, kind of tough to nail it down to a particular species, but as far as the bone goes, it looks like a hypsilophodon, which is native uh, and found, uh, whole skeletons are found in England. This is a, a smaller bipedal one, very similar to Othnelia or Dryosaurus. The big one that you might uh, note is a Utah raptor, and another one that uh, was just recently described and, and uh, is a dinosaur called Theophytalia, very similar to Camptosaurus. In fact, they thought it was a Camptosaurus for the longest time. They got to looking and examining where it had been found and noted some differences in the skull, and they had to rename it to Theophytalia. Now, the pieces that we have, I have a piece of Utah raptor here. But let's, let's look at some of these dinosaurs here. There's Utah raptor over here. The uh, killing claw is probably the thing that sticks out the most about it. There's a picture of the Hypsilophodon. Here we have, and this is in a giant boulder just outside of Grand Junction. You see the bone is, is right in here, and this is the, uh, the femur of the Utah Raptor right in here. Totally encased in the, it's a, just an impression of that bone there. And this, if you look up further, you can see where that boulder came from. Um, again, this is, this is really rough stuff to go through. Uh, it's hard to get um, good preservation out of some of these bones and a lot of it's falling off of hillsides and so forth. This is the Theophytalia and this is the skull that they looked at. This guy was found um, around the Garden of the Gods area. And that's an artist representation of what, what that one looks like. We'll get to the late Cretaceous here shortly. I do want to show you the, the killing claw for Utah Raptor. This would have been on the toe, on the, on the first toe. And again, this claw would have extended out here. This claw would have been about a foot long or so in real life. And uh, the tendons here would have held it straight up off the ground on the foot. And when it was ready to employ these uh, lethal devices, it would snap them and the tendon would snap much like a switchblade. This would have been able to cut a foot deep and about six feet across. Really nasty. Uh, Utah Raptor, 20 feet long. And interestingly enough, all the related ones like Velociraptor and Deinonychus are a lot smaller. In fact, Velociraptor that you see in Jurassic Park would have been eye level with me in Jurassic Park would have actually been up to about my knee in real life. It's uh, interesting that uh, they found Utah Raptor when they did in 1993. 1993 was the year that Jurassic Park came out. And uh, Steven Spielberg made his Velociraptors very large. And he knew people like myself, who I was, well, you know, a teenager at the time and still very much into dinosaurs. Velociraptor's not that big. Well, luckily they found this Utah Raptor right around the time that it came out, supporting the idea that, yeah, those, those raptor dinosaurs could get that big. He got a lucky break. 
Now we'll move on to the late Cretaceous, 75 million years ago, and uh, we've got the wonderful interior seaway, which is full of its own bit of uh, nasty critters. A lot of uh, sea, sea monsters that you might think of, uh, plesiosaurs and so forth, would have lived in that seaway at the time. It basically divided the North America in half. And we're looking here at, uh, at Colorado. There's not a whole lot of space for, for moving here in Colorado. A lot of the dinosaurs that we have would have lived in Montana and traveled down to New Mexico for migration during, during this time. And some of the dinosaurs that we have from this time period, again, they, we don't have traces of these guys. We have the inference that they would have, would have come through here. So we have an increased heat temperature, part of Colorado is underwater, the eastern half. It's a great place to look for some of these things like these uh, water creatures, the, the turtles and uh, mosasaurs and so forth that were big sea reptiles. They actually found one I think outside of Pueblo not too long ago. The dinosaurs discovered an animal called Pentaceratops, another animal called Parasaurolophus, a Daspletosaurus and Gorgosaurus. These guys are both relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex. A Sauronithalestes, which is basically the American equivalent to a Velociraptor. Velociraptor did not live in the United States. It's only found in Mongolia and China. Um, a dinosaur called Edmontonia and a Spherotholus. Interesting names. We'll, we'll shed some light on what they looked like here. On the top left is the Pentaceratops, very similar to Triceratops. The reason they call it Pentaceratops means five horns on the face has to do with these uh, cheekbones right here. Now, um, they're a little bit larger than they are in other, other animals that look like this. Um, just Because uh, all of these ceratopsians have these little cheekbones, it's just they were a little bit more prominent in pentaceratops. Pentaceratops also had a very large skull, and the difference between it and triceratops is in this area here. This right here would have been a hole as bone. Triceratops didn't have those holes, or fenestrae as they call them. And um, very similar in size. This guy was originally found in New Mexico, but pieces of him have also been found in Colorado. Parasaurolophus is the next one, the very long tubular crest here. Uh, originally, scientists thought that it would have used it as a snorkel, swimming under the water. Um, however, there's no opening back here. So what they looked at, and they, they kind of carved open the side to take a look at it, and this is a hollow chamber that is hooked right up to the nasal passages. This guy would have been able to make some very interesting sounds, was very vocal in how it communicated with other animals of its species. And if you go to the, the uh, New Mexico Museum of Natural History, you can actually play what this animal may have sounded like. You can press a button and it sounds a little like a, a sick trombone. <clears throat> Animal right below Parasaurolophus is an armored ankylosaur called Edmontonia. And uh, this guy actually did survive until the end of the Cretaceous. And uh, there's really not a whole lot of arguing with him. These, these spikes would have uh, been pretty nasty to deal with. This dinosaur right here is Daspletosaurus. Very strong, very, very powerful. Probably would have hunted guys like Pentaceratops. This is the, thought to be the direct ancestor of Tyrannosaurus rex. Has very similar features, just came from an earlier time period. The dinosaur that we're looking at here in wonderful pink and blue feathers is the Sauronithalestes. And uh, most of these dinosaurs that are this size would have been covered in feathers. In fact, they've been looking at Velociraptor right here on the, on the uh, radius and ulna, and they found where the feathers would have actually gone, right in this area here. And these dinosaurs, of course, also had the very long tails. And at the end of these tails, they were, they were nice and stiff, so these guys could run and make, make nice, quick turns. But at some of, these, some of the ends of these tails, we have something that, that uh, modern birds have today, where the feathers attach at the, at the base of the tail. It's just, of course, the tail is a lot longer. And um, it couldn't fly. It was too big didn't have the right kind of muscles to fly. And feathers are meant for more than just flight. Feathers are meant for insulation and also for display. Think of a peacock. Those feathers on the back end are 
not used for anything else but display. The animal that we have over here is another relative of T-Rex. This is Gorgosaurus. It's got a much lighter build than Daspletosaurus. Well, quite a bit faster. This guy probably would have hunted down guys like Parasaurolophus and, and other things that would have been uh, available at the time. This dinosaur is interesting because we also have, uh, up in Alberta, Canada, a, an assemblage of bones that shows that these dinosaurs actually would have lived in family groups and probably would have hunted as a family as well. So uh, the days of dinosaurs hunting alone and being alone is, is pretty much over. Which of course by process of elimination this is a relative of what most folks are familiar with as Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus had a relative, this one is named Spherotholus, and it's due to the really round dome on the head that, it's, that it gets its name. It's almost a perfect sphere. Now, what it used it for is still a matter of debate. Because there are some scientists who've said, well, they, they hit heads, they ran into each other like rams. Well, the problem is, if you've got a dome on, uh, two domes like that hitting, you might have some slippage there and they could have broken their necks that way. Um, the other thought is that these guys grew these over time and it was a, it was a, a species indicator. Uh, they might have actually done a little bit of headbutting, but not, not running against each other when they're fighting over who gets to take the girl out. And now we'll move to the late Cretaceous, 68 million years ago, about three million years before the massive asteroid impact that would have hit down here in the Yucatan Peninsula. As you can see, the interior seaway has been broken up. There's still parts of, of uh, Colorado that are a bit underwater, but for the most part, things are looking good. It's a little less wet. Colorado climate is very much like the southeastern United States today. More swampy, uh, very hot and humid, not a place I, I care to live forever, but uh, especially in the summertime, it's one of those places where it's just as hot in the shade as it is without, out of the shade. Here's some of the dinosaurs discovered, Triceratops, Taurosaurus, Ornithomimus, Thessalosaurus, Edmontosaurus, Alamosaurus, which you may think is found in a particular place, but I'll tell you a story about that one. And of course, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, the first three that we have here, this is good old Triceratops, and this is his cousin, the Taurosaurus. If you look at the uh, shield here, you'll notice some distinct differences. Uh, one being all these nice protuberances, and the other, these are big holes again, and a lack of any sort of ornamentation here. These guys, had the biggest heads of any animal that we know of. These skulls could go from the tip of the beak to the end of the uh, shield, and they could be 10 feet in length. Huge animals. And of course, in order to support that bulk, you've got to have a good strong neck. These guys would have uh, weighed in about the same weight as an elephant today. They would have lived in, in family groups. And uh, interestingly enough, they've recently discovered that these dinosaurs we call ceratopsians actually went through quite a bit of changes as they grew. No matter how many horns they have on their face, they all started out with the same amount. They all looked pretty much the same. No matter if they had a, a horn that went this way, this way, long nasal horn, they all pretty much started out the same. And as they grew, these other distinguishing features would become a part of them. So. Um, what did these guys use their shields and, and horns for? Well, defense, probably not so much. This is really thin stuff. And a Tyrannosaurus rex would have no problem biting right through it. With the uh, bite force that T-Rex had of easily 7,000 pounds per square inch, not a problem. Probably being able to bite off one of these horns. These could be used like antelope use. Uh, there's several different types of antelope that are in Africa. They have some of the strangest horns you've ever seen. They're curled up. They're in all kinds of different, uh, they are in various different ways. Well, use them for species identification. Use them to show that uh, you're better looking than this guy. And don't rule out defense because, uh, you know, these are, these are Triceratops horns right here. These are the brow horns. These could get three feet in length. 
they would have been a, very sharp and, and you'd want to stay away from them. And uh, so I wouldn't rule out defense. I would also wouldn't rule out these guys fighting like, like elk and modern, modern antelope do today with their, with their horns. This dinosaur is a sauropod called Alamosaurus. It's different than Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus and so forth. This guy probably had a little bit of armor on his back. He's related to a group of uh, sauropods they call Titanosaurs. Titanosaurs are primarily found in the southern continents of South America, Africa, parts of India as well. And um, as we saw a few slides ago, South America and Africa were pretty much separated. So how did they get here? Well, there might have been a couple of them that, that stayed. This guy was about 70 feet long, and I know Alamo sounds like it was found in Texas, right? It was found in New Mexico, actually. It's named after the formation that it was found in. There, an Alamosaurus definitely would have migrated north and uh, would have been a tasty meal for any Tyrannosaurus rex that it would have come across. So the old movies that have a Tyrannosaurus rex fighting an animal like this for a meal, actually plausible now, as long as they don't call it Brontosaurus. Here's a few of the other ones. The one on the top left is Ornithomimus. Looks very much like a bird, uh, very much like an ostrich, and uh, its name means ostrich mimic. Probably had some feathers on it. Didn't have any teeth. No teeth. Probably ran about as fast as an ostrich did as well, about 40 miles an hour. Probably had a mixed diet. Could have eaten eggs, but uh, without, the, uh, without the teeth, it probably would have been feeding on, on things like eggs and, and maybe shellfish and so forth. This is Thessalosaurus here. These two are roughly the same, same length, 10 to 13 feet. This is a planator, and the interesting thing about this Thessalosaurus is they've looked and they found a massive uh, material in, in one of the skeletons of this, and it looked to kind of interesting and odd to them, so they got a CT scanner and they looked and they found a four-chambered heart in the CT scan. So the, the kind of cold-blooded idea kind of goes away with this as well as the feathers and the fact that a lot of these animals had hollow bones like birds and also had wishbones as well. The animal on the bottom is Edmontonia. Um, this is the cow of the Cretaceous, quite, quite literally. And uh, Edmonto or Edmontosaurus, excuse me, had this wonderful set of teeth. They're very closely packed together and could have about 400 of these teeth in its mouth at any given time. This is a, a cud chewer. You would grind up its food, and chew it, and uh, if any one of these fell out, well, I mean, it had plenty to, plenty to just regrow. Interesting thing about Edmontosaurus as well, this is the dinosaur that we find that is mummified the most. We find skin impressions on these guys quite a bit. Um, I have one of those skin impressions here from Edmontosaurus. And uh, some of the relatives of Edmontosaurus are some of the ones that we're looking at very closely as far as they've, they've been well preserved and of course it would take, take some very interesting circumstances to get them in that way. They've actually been able to find relatives of Edmontosaurus that still have the plants, remnants of the plants that they ate. They also have been able to determine that the tail would have been a little bit longer, would have attached probably a little bit lower here, and there probably would have been some stripes on the end of this tail as well. Some of the things they've been able to do with, and uh, they've, uh, one of the, the dinosaur that they're looking at uh, is called Leonardo. They're, they're looking at him in all sorts of, sorts of cool ways. And of course, this is Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, notice the coloring here. This is probably the male, and this would probably be the female. Female, interestingly enough, is probably a little bit larger, a little bit more heavily built than the male. Um, we see this in crocodiles today. Crocodile, the female, is actually a little bit larger than the male, uh, uh, snakes as well. One of the other things I have from Edmontosaurus is the vertebrae here. This is from a juvenile. These actually got quite a bit larger. And uh, don't have any 
pieces of Thessalosaurus, uh, Ornithomimus, I left those in the museum. Little claws that I had. Um, for T-Rex, I have his brain. This is, this is it. Big animal. The, the skull for T-Rex was 60 inches, which is 5 feet. Um, but his brain wasn't that big. However, it is on the upper end of, of the smartness scale for dinosaurs. Most of these, relative to the body size, they had a pretty good, good size brain. The uh, sauropods probably wouldn't be able to uh, operate a door that opened once you stepped on it. So uh, they, were, they were incredibly unintelligent. But if you sacrifice the, the brain for feeding, then, then you can survive. I also have one of the teeth for Tyrannosaurus rex. This actually has the root in it. And the root starts where the line gets darker and continues on up. These are very thick roots, very big. So the tooth itself would have been right here. And these teeth actually got a bit larger. They could get as big as a, as a full-size banana, good, good size Chiquita. And they would have been as big around. Uh, the serrations, interestingly enough, on, on Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus are at the end. And if we look, the teeth for Tyrannosaurus rex are a lot thicker. These guys would have uh, been tearing into their prey and slicing and dicing it. Tyrannosaurus rex didn't care. He'd bite into the meat, he'd bite into the bone, and he'd crunch it up, and uh, it would pass through, and uh, it has passed through. They found a, what they call a coprolite of T. rex. This is dinosaur poop. And they looked at this big piece of rock that is about the size of a French bread loaf. They looked inside, and they found tiny little fragments of bone in there. Ouch, painful. And they belong to Edmontosaurus. So um, they definitely, uh, they definitely were were enemies. And uh, the other thing that uh, is interesting about these two, you go up to the Denver Museum, you look at the skeleton that they have of Edmontosaurus, and you see that there's a chunk taken out of the tail. It started to reheal. The only animal big enough to take a chunk out of an Edmontosaurus is T. Rex. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, Ken Carpenter, who's about as tall as I am, gets up on this big, huge ladder. These guys were probably 15 feet tall or more, these Edmontosaurus. He gets up there, and he takes a T-Rex tooth, and he puts it in the spot where there are tooth marks. And it fits perfectly. Now, um, this, this is evidence that uh, Tyrannosaurus could have hunted down its prey. So. Um, it wasn't just a scavenger. Most terrestrial carnivores can't survive on one or the other. They are usually looking to survive in the best way they know how, and that is, if there's a free meal, eat it. If you gotta hunt for something, hunt for it. Now, that's only 40 of them. There's a heck of a lot more dinosaurs, I believe. To date, there's uh, probably about 7,000. And every year, there's probably about 12 or so new that are found every single year. Um, but uh, the problem that we have is that uh, fossilization is incredibly rare. It has to happen under the right conditions. And uh, in the case of these mummified hadrosaurs, which is, is an, a, a, one of the Edmontosaurus is one of them, has to happen under the right circumstances. There has to be a flood. They have to be buried quickly, and no animal can, can touch them in order for that to happen. Now, if you look around today and you look at uh, animals that die on the road, they get eaten. Bones get picked apart. If, you live, if you're an animal and you live in the mountains and you die in the mountains, those bones fall off the mountainside. They get crushed. They get smashed. They get carried away by, by uh, wolves and so forth that want to continue to gnaw on them and maybe break out the marrow. Um, fossilization is incredibly rare. And the larger animals, you'll notice that we had a lot of larger animals throughout all these slides. Larger animals are better preserved. Well, why is that? Well, there's just simply more of them to preserve. Smaller ones like fruitidens, and it's interesting, the only, really, the pieces that they have of fruitiden, fruitidens, the jaw fits on my first, the first digit of my finger. Really tiny. 
um, you have to have the right kind of preservation. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of animals with feathers here that we found that feathers are preserved in Colorado is due to the nature of the preservation. China is a better place for that because of the of the sediment that's there. You have these really fine paper shales there that can that can um, when they when they have an animal that dies in the in those lake areas preserves them very well because it just lays them down to these nice thin thin layers. <clears throat> now the other thing that uh, we're looking at, and you probably saw through some of the slides, there were a lot of other animals that existed at the same time that dinosaurs did. Mammals were around, uh, have been around as long as dinosaurs. They came around the same time. It's just that uh, dinosaurs were occupying all the uh, quote-unquote good niches, and the mammals had to kind of stay underground and, and be in other places. There were also plenty of crocodiles to go around in this area. Um, throughout all of Colorado, there were plenty of turtles, uh, snakes didn't show up till the Cretaceous, but we had snakes. There were plenty of the flying reptiles called pterosaurs, like Pteranodon and, and Quetzalcoatlus. These guys were basically flying flying jets. They would have had wingspans of anywhere from 30 to 40 feet. Some of them were much smaller than that, but there were some very interesting animals. Um, and um, there's there's plenty of other things. Uh, the Jurassic is a is a wonderful example. The, number of animals found in the Jurassic, only a third of them are actually dinosaurs. The rest of them are other animals, turtles, crocs, and, and so forth. <clears throat> so, are there any questions? Yes? Not being a biologist, you mentioned a four-chambered heart, is it that meant something? A four-chambered heart is, uh, is unique in, I mean, crocodiles have a four-chambered heart, but it's the way that the chambers are used. Most birds and mammals have four-chambered hearts. They, they all have the four-chambered heart. And it's the way in which the valves hook up to each other that determines whether the animal probably had uh, a warm-bloodedness or a cold-bloodedness. And um, this four-chambered heart was found to resemble more that, that more of uh, mammals and, and birds. The other interesting thing is uh, when you look at the cross-section of any of these bones, you look to see how many holes are in the bones because that's where we get our blood. And you look at the holes, the more holes you have, the more blood that can run through you to warm you up. The uh, reptiles, generally, crocodiles and so forth, don't have a lot as compared to mammals and birds. And dinosaurs have a lot more than reptiles, but fewer than mammals and birds. They're kind of right in between. And let's see, one other bit of, of uh, information, if you guys have time, visit the Ryan Museum. They have their hours and, and it's, a great, it's a great little museum to go in and look at. It's uh, where I keep a lot of these specimens as well as some wonderful mi mineral specimens and uh, some other fossils that uh, some of the students have found as well. Any other questions? Adams State College. Great stories begin here.